Mr. Jeff Daniels is on the show tonight. How are you, Jeff? I'm so happy to see you. I'm wondering if you are feeling slightly smug right now, whilst lots of people are fleeing the cities in which they live. You were way ahead of the curve. You've been living in Michigan for years now. Uh, how is everything there? Is everything good? I have been preparing for this pandemic since 1986. <laughs> we moved back here. We moved back to a small town in Michigan and uh, raised the kids here. And uh, and you're right. People are are going to the cities. They're leaving the cities, going to the small towns. And uh, uh, yeah, we're already here. It's it's been good. It's been good. It's a little. I mean, we're healthy. Start there. Yeah. But it's also yeah. a little bit like a forced retirement. So except for the gold watch, it, that's what it feels like. What's it like for you in Michigan when you walk around the town and things? Do people, do people care about your career? Do they, they, they care about your celebrity? Are they interested in fame? Um, it depends. Um, the people around me, uh, closer to me, uh, you know, are know, know that it's a job and that I've been doing it a long time. It's the people that, that see me that you, their voices get a little louder, they talk a little faster. It's not too many of them. Uh, people are real good about kind of leaving me alone and letting me live my life. I don't. I certainly don't go around, you know, saying I don't know if you saw me in a recent thing, but uh, <laughs> I, you know, love to talk about it with you. Oh, what's your name? I'm sorry. You know, there's none of that. I kind of, I kind of, I'm pretty reclusive to be honest. Weren't you added to the Michigan Walk of Fame? Is that yes. right? Yes. Appar apparently, that was an honor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> up, up at the of the uh, the Capitol, in Lansing. This was easily 10, 15 years ago. Uh, the governor decided to let me uh, wanted me to get a star on the Michigan Walk of Fame, mm. along with Gerald Ford and Thomas Edison, and I believe Stevie Wonder. Right. Um, there were about 30 people there. Um, it's the Midwest, you know. They kind of don't know what to make of it. Sure. They're kind of looking. Sure. So you have a what? You have a you have something on a sidewalk? Yeah, yeah, huh. Is that, uh, do I have to step over that? Or what is that? Is there a <laughs> gate? No, it's just, it's just people walk on it. At least out in Hollywood, there, there are lots of them. Really? Hollywood, and so now we have one. Oh, okay. Do you have one in Hollywood? No, I don't. I don't. I don't have one in Hollywood. <laughs> These are the conversations I have with people about fame in Michigan. Yes. Now, the last time I saw you, uh, we were at the Tony Awards, where you were, you were nominated for To Kill a Mockingbird, which was a huge success and, and a massive undertaking, taking on that role. In fact, I can remember the last time you were here at the studio, we were chatting in the dressing room, and you were saying that you were, you know, you were signing up for a whole year, and it's eight shows a week, and, uh, you know, how difficult that can be. And I was amazed to hear that you, you never missed a single show, which... Is astonishing in, in a year. How is that possible? And did everything go smoothly during the run? I, I uh, well, you did one man, two governors, you know. How, yeah. how long did you do that? We did it for uh, on and off, really, about 22 months. But I missed four shows when I was sick. See, it's the thing. It's the thing that, the, I mean, and you were all, I went to see that. I saw you backstage. I loved what you did. And it was like, but the show has to have you out there. And that's how I took Mockingbird, especially after we got the five-star reviews. People yeah. were starting to, you know, buy tickets five months ahead of time. And so I said, you know what? I'm not taking two weeks off in the middle of July when people have paid all that money for planes and hotels and God knows Broadway tickets. So I'm, yeah. I just said, let's see if I can do it. But, you know, what, what happens is it never goes perfectly every no. single night. There's always something, whether it's an actor forgetting lines, or one night we had, um, we had a whole bunch of sets that would come down and come in, and so they needed um, air pressure, a compressor, a big, big thing in the back of the stage, and one night a valve blew on it, and it just... It sounded like a shuttle was taking off. It was just so loud. And I was on stage with uh, Calpurnia, and the stage manager came on, the God mic, we call it, and yeah. said, actors, yeah. leave the stage. Actors, leave the stage. And you got 1,400 people sitting out there in the Schubert Theater listening to this, this, this thing go for 30 seconds. 
and I couldn't leave. I said, this is, there's, there's just too good an opportunity here. So I waited for the compressor to kind of peter out and waited about 30 seconds before it ran out of, you know, psh. and then I walked to the front of the Schubert theater stage and I said, ladies and gentlemen, congratulations. You were here on the night that the Schubert theater farted. <laughs> Oh, and then so, I walked off stage. <laughs> but then did he get fixed? Did you carry on with the performance? Oh, we came back like oh, 10 okay, minutes right. later when they, you know, they shut the valve and, you know, and then you just pick up and the audience is, they're, they're glad that you're coming back. Now, when you're, when you're doing a show like that, when you're on Broadway, are you someone, do you, do you like to be visited backstage afterwards? If, if people are in, you know what I mean, Fre friends or other actors, yeah. directors, do you enjoy it when people come backstage? I do. I, I, you know, it's a chance to meet people that you never would meet otherwise. Totally. Um, you know, that's, that's the great thing. And, and, you know, if you're in a hit, then they're coming back because they liked it and they want it. That, that, that's a whole different, that's, that's great. No one has to come back and lie and go, oh, wonderful, when it wasn't. It, that, they're, so we had, my God, we had the Bidens, we had Michelle Obama, we had Justice Sotomayor, we had... Um, Pacino came, Don De Niro came and wow. sit in my dressing room. I mean, you're just, you're on and on and on. Uh, Bette Midler came. I was in Bette Midler's dressing room when she was there for Hello, Dolly. Yeah. So people would come in to the dressing room. And I would tell them Bette Midler's dressing room. They're going, really? Yeah. And then I'd open the bathroom and go, her toilet. <laughs> um, who came uh, that really, oh, Justin Timberlake came. Oh, yeah. He and Jessica came, and they came back, and I'd never met either one of them. And, and, he, and, and Atticus Finch was so still and so private and buttoned up that usually the Broadway performance, which you go to the balcony with, sure. that wasn't what I could do. So I was pulling them in, and there was a lot of stillness. And Justin came back, and it was great. He talked to me about the power of stillness and using that. And... And he said, you did it. And he talked about the first time he saw Michael Jackson when Justin was, you know, I don't know, high school, something. And he saw him and Michael stood there in the first two minutes of the show. And Justin got up in my dressing room and is five feet from me showing this. I mean, a guy who can dance like nobody, right? And he's standing there and he goes, Michael just stood there and I watched him with backlight and then for like a minute and then he just raised his hand up above and the place was going, that's all he did. And then boom, and then he went into Thriller or something. He goes, the power of stillness. It was like a demonstration of it by Justin Timberlake in my dressing room. It's just <laughs> stuff like that. You just, you'll yeah, never, those, those you'll moments never get you think that. I'd never get to have this. This would never ever happen unless I'd just been on stage. I mean, I know that theater is such a big part of your life. You, you founded a theater in, in Michigan, uh, the Purple Rose, obviously, Every corner of live entertainment is suffering right now. Uh, what can what can be done? What can be what can we do to, to save the theatre? Wear a mask. Start there. We all wore a mask. This would be over more quickly. And it's it's so simple. Yet that's not the country we live in right now. I hope theatres come back. Smaller theatres, live music venues. I hope they come back. We're going to need them. Uh, a year, uh, we're looking at a year from now before yep. people can sit shoulder to shoulder, and we're hoping they can. I, you know, I think uh, Broadway will come back. I think people are going to want that live experience that's happening right there in front of them, just for them that night. I still think people are going to want that. God knows it's survived for hundreds of years. It's, it's survived through a lot of things worse than this: world wars, you know, 9/11. Uh, uh, it's it's. <laughs> I like our chances for theater and live, live venues to come back. It's just whether they can financially hang on. I hope they can so much. Now, we have to congratulate you on, the, on your brilliant new miniseries, the, the Comey Rule, where you play former FBI director James Comey. Um, as I was watching it, I experienced a little PTSD, if I'm honest. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, yeah. tell, them, tell them what it's about. It's James Comey's story. It's his side of the story. Uh, of what it was like when Trump became president and Trump sat him down and said, I need loyalty, and Jim didn't do that, and, uh, and then Jim was history. It's Jim's side of the story. We know Trump's side of the story, which is Comey's a liar. Well, this is Jim's side. 
you're also, and I learned this, you're going to find that this guy was up, was between a rock and a hard place with these decisions that were so, for the rest of us, living on social media, what is he thinking? Well, the movie shows you what he was thinking and what he was up against and how these weren't easy decisions. And his whole North Star was something bigger than he was. And that was the rule of law, for instance. And he hung on to that. And he was going up against someone uh, who basically is trashing the rule of law. And he's not alone, Trump. Uh, and, and I think that's, what the Comey rule will show you is that that has to still matter in this country, things like the rule of law. That has to be respected by everyone. Certainly Barry Goldwater respected it enough that when Nixon was breaking the law, he marched the Republicans up to the White House and said, you need to resign. We don't have those Republicans right now. No. And so no. the Comey rule will demonstrate that that's important. So is decency. So is honesty. So is telling the truth. Those are things that matter. And if it matters to you, perhaps we'll all go into this election a little bit more informed than we were in October 2016. I mean, the, President Trump is played brilliantly by Brendan Gleeson, who I just seems to just shock me with, with every performance he, he gives. Uh, but is this true? There was a moment, albeit a small one, that you considered the notion of playing both Comey and Trump. Is that true? Yes. <laughs> what would that have been like? Um, madness. <laughs> yeah. um, it, we, I don't, you're too young, but the Patty Duke show way back when she played two people and it was like the 70s. And there's, you know, where you're playing twins. I did it in Purple Rose of Cairo for Woody Allen, where I played two people talking to each other. I, I, we were having trouble getting somebody to do it. No American actor wanted to touch it. Brendan had passed once. And we were about to go back to him, hoping, and, and I, I was thinking, what if I did both? Then my wife said, think of all the lines you'll have to learn, because Trump never stops talking. And I said, you're right, I'm out, never mind, forget <laughs> it. <laughs> now, tomorrow night is the first presidential debate. Everything you've learned about Trump doing this project, the, the, the people that you've met, the research that I know you will have done, what would be your one bit of advice for Joe Biden before he steps on the stage tomorrow night? Call him on it. Call him on it. Verbally, verbally. You want to take on a bully? Punch him in the mouth with your words. Call him on his... All of this. Call him on the lies. Call him on the flip-flops. Call him on, uh, don't worry, it's just a hoax. It's just like the flu. And then talking to Bob Woodward. Call him on it. He's never called on it. He brushes it off like it's not going to happen. Call him on it right in front of America. Let's go. Answer it. Answer your lies. Answer your flip-flops. Answer your two-faced. Answer your... You're telling these people at these rallies one thing and then you're doing another. These people need to know. I mean, they were... They were conned once. Can't happen again. You know? Not from... Not, not, not now. It's too important. This election is too important to people. And I think Biden needs to just come on and... and God help him when he brings up Bo Biden. And, and you called my son a loser and a sucker. Trump better have an answer for that.